today's call to worship comes from Job 1, 20 to 21. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, what have you encountered this week? Uh, did you encounter the Lord who takes away, or have you encountered the Lord that gives? Um, if that's too abstract, how about uh, the good things that happened in your life this week? The things that you got, new relationships, or a new job, or uh, a good grade, uh, or uh, what are the things that, it's, that uh, has been taken away from you? Is it... Um, uh, is some happiness, maybe, uh, some uh, relationship, uh, money, or whatnot. In either way, uh, the job is calling us to, regardless of uh, our situation, uh, whether God takes away or God gives, that we're called to praise the Lord. In a way, we're called to be a worshiper. So, uh, brothers and sisters, let's pray and gather our hearts to worship the Lord today. Lord, we come from different walks in life. Um, we live the individual lives, uh, work, school, family. Uh, Lord, we gather here today collectively as a one body of Christ. And we desire to worship you because you are calling us to be your worshiper. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning, church. Let's all rise for a time of worship. Sing light of the world. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, King of all days. Oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin 
upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me sing you are forever in my life you are forever in my life you see me through the season cover me with your hands and lead me in your righteousness and I look to you and I wait on you. I'll sing to you, Lord, a hymn of love for your faithfulness to me. I'm carried in everlasting arms. You'll never let You are forever. You are forever in my life. You see me through the seasons. Cover me with your hands and lead me in your righteousness and I look to you and I wait on you I'll sing to you Lord a hymn of love for your faithfulness to me I'm carried in everlasting arms You'll never let me go. I'll sing, and I'll sing to you, Lord, a hymn of love for your faithfulness to me. I'm carried in everlasting arms. You'll never let me Hallelujah. 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 I'll sing 
to you, Lord, a hymn of love for your faithfulness to me. I'm carried in everlasting arms. You'll never let me go. And I'll sing to you, Lord, a hymn of love for your faithfulness to me. I'm carried in everlasting arms. You'll never let me go through it all. Sing, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you pay, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. For nail pierced hands, wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb, seated on. Crown you now with many crowns, you reign victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the darling of heaven. If I worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, thank you for the cross, Lord, thank you for the cross, you. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for nail pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb, seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns, you reign. Victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus, God of God, the darling of heaven, crucified, worthy is the 
worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Let's pray. Um, dearly Father, God, we come before you, God, and we just want to say, God, that we are here to worship you, God. Um, God, we come before you today, God, with uh, different struggles, God, different trials and tribulations, God, that each and every one of us are, are going through, God. And God, we confess, God, that God, we don't have the strength on our own to, to carry on, God. God, we just want to sing these songs. God, we want to lift up these praises to you, God, because, God, we want to lean on you, God. We want to put our burdens upon you, God, because, God, your burden um, is light, God, and your yoke is easy. God, may we just come before you today, God, and know that you are a good God um, that has so much has so much love for us, God, and wants God, to be our strength, God. Because we were sinners, God. We can do nothing on our own, God. We are we still sin today, God. And the place, God, that that we want to go, we cannot go with our own strength, God. And that is why you sent your son um, to come upon this earth, that he would take upon all our sins, God, and that he would give us his righteousness, God, so that we can um, we can be with you, God. We can call you Father. Um, and God that we can sing these songs, God, thanking you for the grace that you've shown us, that we can sing these songs singing, worthy, worthy is the lamb um, that was slain on our behalf and that was lifted up uh, and is sitting on your right hand today, God. So thank you, God, that we can sing these songs. God, thank you for your God that loves us so much despite um, our sinful nature. Um, thank you that we can gather today, God, and call you Father. God, as we, just, as we receive your message today, God, through your servant, Pastor Joe, God, I pray that we would just be reminded, God, that it would give us peace, um, that we'd be reminded of your gospel message today, God, through your word, and that it would transform our hearts and our minds. Uh, thank you once again. Please, I pray. Amen. Today's Confession of Sins passage comes from Job 42, 3-6. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, the things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you, Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is Job. For those of you who know Job, uh, you know what this is about. But for those of you who don't, God takes away everything, including his own kids. And Job's three friends came and uh, criticizing Job. And now Job saying, I didn't do anything wrong. Why am I getting punished? Then God shows up. After God shows up, there's a change in Job's attitude. And here is his attitude. And in life, I suppose it's not really about, in, in our walk with God, it's not really about what God gives and what God takes away in the end. But it's really about who God is. When we truly encounter who God, who God is in our life, then perhaps it's not about the, all these things that we have or not have, but perhaps it's about who God is and who we are in the light of who God is. So here's a confession that when Job, he heard about God, but now that he sees God with his own eyes, that there is a transformation. And now that transformation is recognizing who God is and who he is. And when you realize that, then I think, only thing you can do is go humble before the Lord and repent. 
So today, uh, how do we encounter God? And through worship, through singing the worship songs. And another great way of encountering God is through the word of God that's, that is about to be preached through uh, Pastor Joel. Today, I want to encourage you and into a time of prayer to open our hearts to receive the word of God, repent our sin, and come our heart in, in, in expectation that you will meet God through the preaching of the word today. Let's pray. The assurance passage comes from Isaiah 55, 8-9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and confess to you in our mind, in our heart, that your ways are are higher than my ways. Your ways are infinitely higher than our ways. And your thoughts are infinitely holier than our thoughts. And you expressed your thoughts and you expressed your ways through your son, Jesus Christ. You expressed your infinite love for infinitely undeserving us, Lord. Lord, show us yourself, Lord Father God, through your word. As Pastor Joel comes and preaches, Lord Father God, I pray that you would express your love, your eternal, infinite love. The God who created the entire universe and put all the things, stars and galaxies in motion in this ever-expanding universe, Lord Father. I pray that still then you love us and you express your love through your word. I pray as our Pastor Joel preaches, Lord Father God, I pray you will express your love for us. And bless Pastor Joel as he comes up and preaches. Lord, give him, empower him with your Holy Spirit and prepare our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, let's say... Uh, Good morning to one another. Greet one another as we dismiss our youth group students. Have wonderful service, youth group students. <clears throat> we are continuing our series in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, by the way, this is the 30th sermon in the, <laughs> in the Gospel of Matthew. And we're in chapter 8, and, you know, it, it, it may be long before we finish, but uh, I, I, am, I hope you're being encouraged as you see God moving uh, through the Gospel of Matthew. Last week, we saw how Jesus showed compassion on a lap, uh, leper. He reached out to touch him, and we said that reach is not just six feet but he came down from heaven to reach us, to touch us. And he touched him and said, be clean. And the leper was immediately cleansed of his leprosy. Uh, we saw how he makes an unclean person clean by becoming unclean himself. He bears the uncleanness himself. Uh, this week, we see two more healings. There's more than uh, two healings, but two main healings. And we see how Jesus elicits faith and serving 
through these miraculous healings. So let's turn to Matthew 8, uh, 5 through 17. Matthew 8, 5 through 17. <clears throat> Hear now the word of God. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And, the century, and to the century, and Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. The word of God. Amen. Well, sorry. I, it's not the end. Let me, let me read a couple more verses. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and fever left her. And she rose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness and bore our diseases. The word of God, amen. Now we come to the end of our text. Let's pray. Father, um, you are the one who grants us faith. You are the one who opens our eyes like you opened Job's eyes. Father, we want to not just be not just hear about you like Job did at one point, but we want to, our, we want to behold you. We, we want our eyes to see you. And that's our prayer as we come. Grant uh, those who are struggling with faith, grant them faith. Help them to see Jesus for who he is and to meet him here in this place. And for those of us who say we believe, Lord, may that transform our lives into people who serve sacrificially because we know the love of Jesus Christ and we see Jesus in our lives. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would, would help us to meet Christ here through the preach word. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This week, uh, or maybe, maybe just recently, have you been pleasantly surprised by something? Anyone? Someone said in the last service, um, Mavericks won. <laughs> Dallas Mavericks won. Pleasant surprise. A very pleasant surprise. By the way, I'm cheering for Mavericks too because uh, my brother subscribes to Fubo and he let me s share the subscription and he says he'll only have it until Mavericks continue. So I'm cheering for Mavericks so that I could, you know, watch Fubo TV more <laughs> for free. <laughs> anyway. Anybody else? Any, any pleasant surprises in your life? Okay, uh, too, too big a group to share. Okay, okay I get it. Um, speaking of a surprise, uh, when I was in college, uh, people from our church uh, prepared a surprise birthday party for me, the first one ever when I was in college. And they did a really good job, kept it a secret, and I had no idea that it was coming. And uh, one of the people who, were, uh, who was uh, arranging the party called uh, my mother and said, can you please tell Joe to come to th uh, this surprise party? Please tell him that he must come. And then my mom called me 
and said, Hey, Joe, go to this surprise party. They're arranging this surprise party for you. <laughs> I love my mom, but she's not the most uh, sensitive woman. <laughs> and uh, it was a wonderful, heartwarming party. I, I, was, I, I, I love that. I, I was so appreciative of people who went out, went out of their way to prepare a surprise party for me. But it was not a surprise. <laughs> I went knowing, and I had to kind of act like I was surprised because I didn't want to ruin it for them. Uh, in our text, Jesus is surprised. He's amazed. He is astonished. And we read in ES, the ESV, Jesus marveled. He's, am he's amazed. That word is amazed. Uh, at the great faith of the centurion. By the way, centurion is an officer in the Roman army in charge of roughly 100 people. Some people say roughly about 80 people. Uh, but, uh, but the name centurion comes from 100, right? The thing I want to ask, the question I want to ask is, how could the Son of God be surprised? Did you ever think about that? How could... The Son of God be amazed. This week, uh, I heard Dr. Sinclair Ferguson's sermon, and it gave me great pleasure uh, because he says, God the Father is surprising God the Son with this surprise gift of this great faith in this man, the centurion. I would have never thought of it that way. And, you know, Dr. Sinclair Ferguson is uh, a knowledgeable man and someone uh, we can trust. And, and he said, after all, when Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus tells Peter, basically, it was my Father in heaven who revealed this to you. Right? So it is a Father who reveals, opens our eyes to see who Jesus Christ is and he did that in this man, the centurion. And Jesus is pleasantly, so pleasantly surprised. How did this come, uh, man come to, to such faith? You know, God the Father opened the centurion's eyes and heart. Um, as, you know, he, he heard about, uh, you know, all these miracles that Jesus had done. And, and he came to faith after hearing about what Jesus was preaching. And God used that. Right? And Jesus uh, is surprised because God the Father takes pleasure in surprising his son with a wonderful gift. Earthly fathers uh, delight in surprising their children. I, I, I wanted to think about, like, what did I surprise my son with? Oh, yesterday... My son was coming into the house, uh, and I, heard, I had my window open, and I tried to surprise him by, by going, boo! But the funny thing was, my son did the same thing as he was coming. We both said boo to one another, and we wanted to surprise one another, and neither of us were surprised. Um, but the Heavenly Father delights in surprising His Son. I mean, earthly fathers do that too, but... Our Heavenly Father delights in giving His Son, whom He loves, a surprise of a, of a man of great faith. So I want to ask this question as we, as we begin. Will Jesus be surprised, amazed, astonished to find men and women of such faith here at Hope? Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> that He would come. And he'll be amazed by your faith. Here's the main point of today's sermon. Here's the main point of today's sermon, and it is this. Jesus advances his kingdom and demonstrates his authority through miraculous healing. And through these, he elicits faith and serving. And we're going to talk about this in two parts, faith and serving. As we continue... Uh, this section about 
uh, miraculous healing, I want to emphasize again that we need to have the big picture in mind. Jesus has inaugurated his kingdom and he's advancing his kingdom. The kingdom of God, right? Kingdom of heaven has invaded the kingdom of this world and there's a collision of two kingdoms going on. Jesus is at war against Satan. Jesus is advancing his kingdom through the preached word and through his works, through his deeds, including miracles. And what we'll see, as, as uh, Matthew describes here, the kingdom will be consummated with a messianic banquet, the party of all parties. Any party animals here? <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, this is a party. This is a celebration, right? I love, I love this party. Uh, I don't know, um, you know, if you have been to wonderful parties. It will be party of one, all parties. And that's the big picture, don't forget. Right? Kingdom of God advancing towards that consummation. And if you zoom in a little more, we see how Jesus demonstrated his authority as the Son of God in preaching, and now he demonstrates his authority through miraculous healings. He just speaks from afar, and the servant of the centurion is healed. Um, Jesus uh, touches Peter in -law's, Peter's uh, mother-in-law, and she's healed. And as we zoom in a little more, in verses 5 through 17, we see that through these things, Jesus elicits faith and serving. Right? He, he gives us faith to believe in Him, and He produces a sacrificial heart of serving. So let's go right to the first point, faith. Jesus comes to Capernaum, uh, the home base of Jesus' ministry now. And, and by the way, my wife and I had the privilege of visiting this small but significant town when we visited Israel. Uh, in Luke's account of the centurion, he tells how the centurion had built the synagogue. And when I visited the synagogue, which by the way, the, the remains of the synagogue uh, is still there, I, I was thinking, wow, this synagogue looks very Romanesque. Why would they build a building that looks very much like the temples of gods in, in Rome? It, it looked Romanesque to me. And, and I, I, you get the answer why it's Romanesque. Because this centurion, right, this Roman centurion had built a synagogue. And he built it in the way he saw fit. It looks Romanesque. Uh, this centurion comes to Jesus and pleads with him, Lord, Kyrie, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. One thing that impresses me about this centurion is that he would care for a servant. Why would you care for a servant? You know, a centurion you know, uh, had a command over roughly 80 to 100 people. He had so many things to do. He was man in power. Why bother with a, a mere servant? He was a compassionate man. By the way, it's also significant that the centurion calls Jesus Lord, Kyrie, uh, because he would have pledged his loyalty to Caesar and said, Caesar is Lord. But now he calls Jesus, Lord. He could have very well have in, endangered his military career by doing so. I mean, some of you might, ah, what's, what's the big deal? Remember, there were Christians who were martyred because they refused to say, Caesar is Lord. They believe Jesus is Lord. And when told to recant at the expense of their lives, they would not recant, and they would say, Jesus is Lord, and they were killed for their faith. So it's significant. Uh, Jesus responds to the centurion with a question. Am I 
to come and heal him. He basically asks, you want me to come and heal him? Uh, those of you who are, who are careful to read the Bible, if you read in the ESV, that's not a question, right? But it can be read that way. But as R.T. France points out, I don't want to bore you with all the grammatical things, but essentially, uh, Jesus is asking a question here. It seems, uh, it seems more likely that Jesus is asking a question than a statement. He is asking, me, am I to come and to heal him? Uh, you know, it would have been considered a defilement, unclean for a Jew to enter a house of a Gentile. And it would have been even more defiant breach uh, of taboo than hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus' question places the racial issue firmly in the forefront of leaders' understanding of the story. Jesus uh, is making us aware this guy is an outsider. He is, he is not one of the uh, the covenant people of Israel. In fact, he serves our enemy, the Roman Empire. He's a Gentile, and he is part of, our, of the Roman Empire, which is our enemy. So when Jesus asks a question such as this, as this, the centurion could very well have been discouraged, but he is undeterred. The centurion... Uh, probably is aware of the racial tension. But his answer to Jesus' question goes beyond speaking about the unclean, clean regulations because he recognizes the authority of Jesus Christ. Right? That's one of the main points. He uh, recognizes the authority of Jesus Christ as a son of God. In verse 8, the centur centurion replies, Lord, Kyrie, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. I'm not worthy. Uh, you see the humility in this man? Right? He recognizes his unworthiness. From all the teachings, preaching, and healings that he had done since Matthew 4.23, you know, some, some person asked me, well, you know, is Matthew 8 the beginning of Jesus' healing ministry? No. Go back to chapter 4. Jesus went around preaching, teaching, and healing people. So it was there before. From, from what he had done, the centurion has come to recognize the majesty and the authority of Jesus as the Son of God. The Father had opened his eyes, and he humbly recognizes his unworthiness in light of who Christ Jesus is. What a humble man. Very impressive. Then he goes on to say, but only say the word, Jesus, and my servant will be healed. The centurion believed that Jesus doesn't have to come to his house to heal his servant who is paralyzed. He believes that Jesus could just say the word right then and there, and his servant would be healed. He says, for I too am a man under authority with soldier under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. What does he mean when he says, I too am a man under authority? Well, he recognizes that he has a derived authority from Caesar, the emperor. And his soldiers followed his orders because he represents Caesar. So when he says to his soldiers, do something, they recognize his authority, right? Because he represents Caesar, and they obey. Then he was also saying that Jesus, is, Jesus derives his authority from God the Father. He recognizes that. And the, and the Son of God... And, and as the Son of God, Jesus also has authority. So the centurion says, just say the word and it will take effect. What an amazing faith. <laughs> Jesus has reasons uh, to be amazed. And we should be amazed too. That this 
a Gentile Roman centurion has faith as such as this. When Jesus hears all this, he marveled, he's amazed, and says, Truly I tell you, no one in Israel have I found such faith. Again, this is a statement of surprise, amazement, astonishment at the great faith of the centurion. Right? The word amazed is used in the book of Matthew only to describe only to describe how people are amazed at Jesus. But here, Jesus is amazed at this centurion. It is a wonderful, uplifting, comment, you know, complimenting or complimentary statement, but not so much if you're a Jew. It is far less complimentary to the people of Israel. What is Jesus saying? I didn't find such faith among the Israelites is what, is, what he is saying. Uh, Jesus also points out that the sons of the kingdom will not be a part of the best party ever, the messianic banquet, the eschatological, the end time banquet to come. There's a paradox here, and you must see the paradox here. You see, the, this Gentile has entered into the kingdom, will be part of this great messianic banquet. But he says, paradoxically, the sons of the kingdom will not be part of that banquet. Who are these sons of the kingdom? <laughs> they, call, they call themselves the sons of the kingdom. These are the Jews who thought they belonged to the kingdom by the virtue of their heritage, by the virtue of their race. They, judge, they would judge the Gentiles and say they're unclean. They don't belong to, to the kingdom, but they did judge themselves and call themselves sons of the kingdom. Jesus says, uh-uh. You ain't truly the sons of the kingdom. You will not enter into the kingdom nor the banquet. They're excluded from the banquet because of their unbelief, because they have not put their faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone for their salvation. This messianic banquet, I want to give you a, a little more detail about this messianic uh, banquet, was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 25. Let's turn there. Isaiah chapter 25. Everyone, uh, turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 25. Turn to verses 6 through 9. Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9. 25, 6 to 9, and it says this, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food. <laughs> Any foodies here? Uh, we have a lot of foodies in our church. Right? Best, best food you would ever taste. A feast of rich food. A feast of well-aged wine. Of rich food full of marrow. Of aged wine well refined. <laughs> wine is emphasized twice. <laughs> Uh, it must be really, really fine wine. Okay. Uh, why is wine emphasized? Because it's a symbol of joy. And there will be celebration. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that casts over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all the nations. What is this veil? It's a, it's a veil that would cover a coffin. And there's veil of death covers all the nations because of sin. Because sin entered and we will all die. But listen to what it says in verse 8. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. Death will be no more. No more tears. And it will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. And we have waited for him. That he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. What a banquet. What a celebration that will be. The greatest, greatest ever. Right? You can't compare any to this one. The host of this banquet in the kingdom of heaven includes Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, a paradox because, yeah, the patriarchs of the Jews are hosts of this banquet. But the sons of the kingdom, the Jews, 
uh, unbelieving Jews are excluded from the banquet. Let me, let me emphasize, unbelieving Jews are excluded from the banquet. Instead, they are thrown into the outer darkness, which represents the absolute separation from God. It's not just the unbelieving Jews, is it? Right? The Jews thought that the Gentiles will, will, will be part of this, uh, this outer darkness. But Jesus shockingly says to the Jews, those of you who do not believe, guess what? That's your destination too. What is this destination? It is hell. There will be, with a, uh, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth or grinding of teeth. Why? Uh, due to the sorrow and anguish of absolute separation from God. What is this utter darkness? Right? This, this outer, utter darkness that they will experience. Well, it's a separation from God. That's what hell is. Right? You'll be separated from the light, joy. You'll be separated from God Himself. And that's, this is the warning of Jesus. And this type of wailing normally occurs at a funeral because someone has died. I don't know if you have been to a, a Middle Eastern a funeral. There's wailing and some people are paid to wail actually. But it will be wailing of the individuals because they will eternally experience death. And the grinding of teeth conveys utter despair as well as terrible pain. Jesus is warning us. This is mercy. You know, uh, let me ask you, are you offended when somebody preaches about hell? First of all, you shouldn't be because Jesus is giving you a lov loving warning to flee. But you have to know that God hates sin so much that He would pour His wrath out on sin but he is merciful and gracious to you that what he has done is he poured his wrath on his own son that the wrath that we all deserve so that for those of us who believe in him would have eternal life be spared from this hell yes it offends but guess what sin offends God so much God the, you know, God, God the Father is offended by sin so much that He has to sacrifice His one and only Son to deal with this sin. And by believing in Him, we're spared. By believing in Jesus Christ, we're spared from this hell. And Jesus is warning us to, to flee. then it is important to, for us to find out then how do you enter into the, the Messianic banquet. Uh, Jesus says in verse 11, Truly I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the, at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Who are these who come from the east and the west? These are the Gentiles, like the centurion, who have put their faith in Christ. Again, this would have been shock to the Jews. Uh, Jesus is saying the sons of the kingdom, Jews are excluded, but the Gentiles are included? Yes. How? If they put their faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus is taking this opportunity to point out that He is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. What was the Abrahamic covenant? Um, it's a covenant in which God promised that all peoples, people from all nation, tribe, and tongue will be saved through His offspring. And the offspring, of course, is Jesus. Judaism was never, you know, um, the biblical the, you know, religion of the Old Testament was never just about the Jews. It was about all nations, people from every tribe and tongue. Jesus is telling us, you have an invitation to the party of all parties. Uh, what's the best party you've been to? 
you know, I've never been to this particular party, but my, my older brother told me that, you know, he went to this party of this really, really rich kid when we lived in the Middle East, right? Um, this kid came to, to school, he's in high school, driving you know, different cars, different luxury cars every day of the week. And we're like, how many luxurious cars do you have uh, as a high school kid? And, and he was invited to this mansion, seemed like a pa palace with many servants. And um, my, my older brother was very sad that, that uh, the food didn't come until late, uh, you know, after like nine o'clock, but you know, they were dancing into the night. And then when the food came out, he couldn't believe how amazing was the feast that was provided. <laughs> the old rich, uh, probably the fanciest uh, party you would ever uh, attend. But that, that kind of party, the parties of this world, the rich and, and the famous throw in this world, cannot even compare to this party which we will enjoy for those of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ. Don't you want to be part of this party? This feast, this banquet? And you can enjoy this party eternally if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone as your Lord and Savior. What we find is that the centurion has put his trust in Christ as his Lord and Savior. And Jesus says to him, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And it's amazing. The centurion servant is immediately healed at that very moment. He did not have to go there. He did not have to even see the person. He just speaks the word and he is healed. What is this reminiscent of? It's reminiscent of how God, our triune God, created the universe out of nothing with just word. Let there be light. Jesus, as a second person of the Trinity, uh, is omniscient, omnipotent, and he can heal without even being near that person. What would, what would this have done for the centurion? His great faith. It would, have elicited, it would have elicited even more faith. And that's what Jesus does with these miraculous healings. And some of you are like, well, Pastor Joe, I don't see too many miraculous healings today. Right? <laughs> we don't do healing services in our church. Well, one of the greatest uh, miracles we see again and again is raising up of dead souls. Isn't that true? We're spiritually dead. And Jesus brings us alive. What, what greater miracle is there than that? Right? Those of us who do not know are dead in our trespasses and sins. And Jesus awakens us, raises us from the dead spiritually, and opens our eyes to believe. That, that, is, that is a great miracle, greater than any of these. Not only does uh, Jesus' miraculous healing elicit faith, but miraculous healings also elicit serving, sacrificial serving. We come to our second point, serving. In verse 14, Jesus enters Peter's house. By the way, my wife and I also uh, saw in Capernaum what some believe to be Peter's house, ruins of Peter's house. And uh, people also believe that, uh, you know, that's where, that's where people worshipped. Right? There was a synagogue, but uh, at Peter's house, that's, that's where we worship Jesus. We read in verse 14 that he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying with a sick fever. It, it could have been something like malaria. And, and we could easily pass by uh, these words, uh, Jesus saw. But you know what? Jesus seized the need of the sick woman and he has compassion on her and he touches her he touches her hand and you know you may think Jesus doesn't care Jesus doesn't see my, my troubles my pain and, and I'm thankful that 
uh, Changil brought, you know, talked about Job. <laughs> Job went through so much suffering and his friends were no help, were they? Right? They, uh, they were questioning you know, him and saying, oh, you, you know, you did all these, you know, you're, you're going through all this suffering because you, you, you're not a righteous man like you claim to be. And Job begins to question God. There's a lot of suffering in his life and he's like, why is God doing this? And some of you struggle with suffering, pain, illness, death. And you ask, does God see? Does God care? And you know, uh, these three mirac mirac uh, miraculous healings that we have been speaking about, including last week's, shows, yes, He does care. He sees. He cares about you. That's why He reaches out to touch Peter's mother-in-law here, and she's healed. And here's a key part that I want you to see in verse 15. She rose and began to serve this is a sweet picture of discipleship, isn't it? Jesus sees you. He touches you. He touches your life. He heals you. What's our response to that? We rise and serve him. There's this pastor by the name of Dick Lucas. Uh, who, uh, he imagines uh, that Peter's mother-in-law may have been um, nagging Peter like a uh, typical mother-in-law in the Near East, and she might have said, why are you so busy with Jesus Christ? Why do you have no time for my daughter and your family? Right? You should be working, earning more money for us, for your daughter. Uh, she could have you know, been uh, nagging her son-in-law in that way, right? saying, don't spend so, too much time with Jesus. But after the healing... Uh, Pastor Dick Lucas imagines <laughs> that she too must have been changed. She not only would have supported Peter serving Jesus Christ, but she would have served, and we see that she served Jesus herself. Uh, that's, that's a picture of a disciple whose life has been transformed, isn't it? Your life has been touched so you rise and you serve. That evening, uh, other gospel writers uh, point out that that day was a Sabbath. Uh, because it is a Sabbath, people uh, refrain from bringing many people to Jesus until evening time. And when the evening comes, when the Sabbath is over, people brought many who were oppressed by demons, demon-possessed. And Jesus casts out evil spirits with a word. And he healed them all. He healed all who were sick, it says. Hyperbole? Healed all who were sick? Uh, B.B. Warfield, uh, a famous theologian, uh, said this, the number of miracles Jesus did may easily be underrated. It has been said that in effect, he banished diseases and death from Palestine for three years. It has been said that Jesus may have banished all diseases and death for three years. If this is an exaggeration, B.B. Warfield says, it is pardonable exaggeration. Jesus was advancing the kingdom of God, showing that the kingdom of God has come, has invaded the kingdom of this world. And he was showing in force that his kingdom is here to stay until its consummation. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that kingdom of Jesus is advancing today. No amens? That kingdom of Jesus is advancing today. And we need to open our eyes to see with eyes of faith how God is moving and advancing his kingdom, changing lives and bringing them, bringing them as disciples of Jesus Christ, as kingdom disciples. The point of all the miraculous signs is, point, is to point to the authority of Jesus Christ as Son of God. And the point is to elicit faith response and to cause those who believe to serve Christ and His kingdom. The verb used to describe how Peter, Peter's mother-in-law served 
uh, in Greek is diakoneo. And what noun form are we familiar with? Diakonos, right? Which is a deacon from where we, you know, where we get the term for deacons and deaconesses. By the way, soon uh, we'll be posting deacon, deaconess nomination forms on our website. Uh, be on the lookout because we want people whose lives have been transformed to, to serve, diaconeo, uh, because of the life transformed. Matthew ends this section on healing with verse 17. It says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our, bore our diseases. What is being emphasized here? Jesus is a fulfillment of God's promises. Jesus is a fulfillment of God's promises in Isaiah 53 of the surf, suffering servant. This is a quote from uh, verse 4 of Isaiah 53. Right? And you might say it's a little bit different uh, than what we have in the ESV. It's a possible translation um, of that verse. Let me read to you the prophecy about the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 and see if it describes Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. You know, this was prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Remember the emphasis that we... Um, we communicated to you last week how Jesus bore our sins. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And I love these, the last phrase. And by his wounds we are healed. Jesus, as a suffering servant, served us to the point of death on the cross. And he served us by suffering in our place. And he saves us by taking our sins upon himself. He bore our sins. Jesus made us clean by becoming unclean himself, like we talked about last week. And he becomes our substitute. He is pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. He is stricken by God, smitten by Him and afflicted in our place. The punishment that we all deserve was placed on Jesus the Son. And by His wounds, we're healed. For those of us who put our faith in Him, this is the gospel truth, isn't it? By his wounds, we're healed. Jesus fulfills this to the T. Then what is a natural response to our Savior who served us in such a way? Who suffered for us in such a way? Well, our response will be to serve him with willingness to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ, knowing that our end, the consummation of all things, is this party, this feast, this banquet with Jesus for all eternity. But let me, let's be frank here. How many of us run when we first see suffering? <laughs> you know, you sign up and say, oh, I want to be a deacon, deaconess in the church. At the first sign of suffering, you say, oh, sorry, I didn't sign up for this, <laughs> right? Um, no, that's what you sign up for. I'm serious. Yeah. You know, many people have come to me and said, wow, why would you want to be a pastor? You know, there's so much suffering. Well, I'm not the only one who called to suffer. <laughs> We're all called to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ. 
if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, we share in his suffering. We participate in his suffering. You get to do it outside of the church and inside the church. I get to only do it inside the church. <laughs> so in some ways, I'm spared the trouble that you, you, know, you have to face, right? So more of you should become pastors <laughs> and pastor's wives uh, as well. Um, Rodney Stark, a great historian who wrote a great book called The Rise of Christianity, uh, wrote about why Christianity succeeded in the early centuries in the Roman world. And he tells us uh, one of the reasons was because when plagues went through the great cities of the Roman Empire, people were literally dying in the s- streets. And, and the first one happened in AD 165. Another one happened in a century later. And most people just stopped taking care of people and headed for the mountains. But Christians didn't. And that's a big reason why Christianity grew. There were two eyewitnesses uh, of what happened. And let me, uh, s- s- let me read to you what the first uh, eyewitness says. The doctors were quite incapable of treating the disease. The people became afraid to visit anyone. And as a result, thousands of people died with no one to look after them. Indeed, there were many houses in which all of the inhabitants perished through lack of any attention. I mean, if you th- thought COVID was bad, this was pretty bad. The bodies of dying were heaped one on top of the other, and half-dead creatures could be seen staggering through the streets. What a nightmare. The catastrophe was so overwhelming that Men became indifferent to every rule of morality. People couldn't care anything about rule. Many pushed sufferers away, even their dearest, even their family members, often throwing them into the road as if they were dead, hoping to avert contagion. (laughs) How selfish. But that's not how Christians acted. The Christians stayed and took care of not only their own sick, but the sick of the people who weren't Christians, people who weren't related to them. Here's what happened. But here's another uh, eyewitness account. Most Christians in the plague, this is what another uh, eyewitness says, most Christians in the plague showed unabounded, unbounded, sorry, unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and only thinking of others. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attended to their every need, ministering to them in Christ, and many departed their life serenely happy. They died with peaceful joy, for they were infected by their neighbors and cheerfully accepted their pains. The best of our brothers lost their lives in this manner, a number of our elders. Many in nursing and caring others transferred their death to themselves and died in their place. The diseases of these people were transferred to them and these Christians died in the place of those who were suffering. Where do you think they got this idea? (laughs) course from what Jesus has done for them Jesus took upon himself the sin the diseases that we deserve and was cursed in our place and died in our place so that we may be spared of God's wrath so that we may receive God's blessings God's salvation instead of the curses as I conclude let me remind us Jesus is advancing his kingdom. Some of you may not see that, may not recognize that, but let me tell you, Jesus is advancing his kingdom. And we ought to see with eyes of faith how he is doing that. He is undoing the effects of sin. And, you know, 
these miracles he's doing is supernatural, but in many ways for Jesus, this is natural. This was what this was what was meant to be when God created the universe. There was no sin. There was supposed to be no death. But sin entered in. So he's doing he's doing all he can to undo the effects of sin. And he will ultimately completely undo the effects of sin. His kingdom will consummate in the best party of all time, the messianic banquet. And we enter into this kingdom. We have invitation into this party only through faith in Jesus Christ. So each, each and every one of us has to examine. Each one and every one. Each and every one in this room has to examine whether we have put our faith in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. Have you put your trust in Him? Then you will enter into this banquet, into this kingdom, into this eternal salvation. And for those of us who are saved, we need to be reminded we've been saved through our suffering servant, Jesus Christ. Are we willing to, to serve others with the love of Jesus Christ and join Christ in serving as He advances the kingdom, even if that means suffering for you? Let me tell you again, suffering is part of the deal. Suffering is part of kingdom discipleship. Serving sacrificially is what all of us are called to do, whether we are officially deacons, <laughs> deaconesses or not, or whether we are elders or pastors or not. All his disciples are supposed to follow Jesus in serving with willingness to suffer. <clears throat> My prayer as I close, is that Jesus will be amazed. That Jesus will be amazed to find men and women of great faith here at Hope. That Jesus will be amazed to find men and women who are sacrificial in their service for His kingdom. I pray that that may be so. And I pray that you will be moved to be such disciples of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, it gives us great pleasure to think about uh, what happened. That God the Father was pleased to surprise you, Lord Jesus with this great faith in this centurion. Father, we pray that that will be true here at Hope. Father, what, how wonderful it would be if Jesus were to be amazed to find men and women of great faith here, men and women who are willing to serve sacrificially here, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work in us so that, that may be true of people at Hope Presbyterian Church. We pray all these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. We're going to respond to the message we've heard uh, by singing this song, Man of Sorrows. By the way, uh, this is from Isaiah 53 too. Jesus is called Man of Sorrows who suffered for us in our place. So let's all stand and sing this song and think about uh, how Jesus suffered for us to save us. <clears throat> Wrath of God 
has been on Jesus' name. Silence as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned. Bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross! Oh, that rugged cross! My salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto me. Sent of heaven. Of heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, that rugged cross. My salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor on to me. Now my death, now my death. Is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my death is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. Where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor on to me. Amen and amen. Please be seated. Uh, let's continue our worship through tithes and offering. Uh, you can give online and you can give uh, personally. There's an offering box in the back. And the reason why we give is because Jesus gave of himself sacrificially. And it's a response to his love, sacrificial love for us. And David will come and pray on behalf of our congregation. Let us pray. Father, Father God, we humbly gather here today to worship you. And we uh, just heard about the example of the centurion who came to Jesus with so much faith. Father God, we live in this very um, uh, tumultuous world where we have so many distractions and so many, th uh, so many things that we don't have faith in. 
Uh, we are asked to have faith in you. We need to have faith in you. We do have faith in you. We have faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came down and humbled himself and sacrificed himself for all of us, though we not deserve it. Help us to realize this uh, truly in our lives, manifested out, and the love that we share to other people, knowing intimately um, your love for us. Father God, help the words that we've heard today um, strengthen us, strengthen our resolve, strengthen our faith, so that we are willing to give and serve and and even suffer at times for for your glory, for the service of others. At this time, I'd like to lift up our our um, tithes and offerings to you, and uh, lift up our um, missionaries that support. Um, at this time, I want to uh, lift up Damien and Youngbin, who have uh, dedicated their lives uh, to serve the, the people of Japan. I know that each of us have our own ministries, be it in another country or just within our neighborhood or our workplace, whatever situation that you place us in. Please help us all to be messengers and missionaries for you and, um, and share your love to others as well. Father God, I, I pray that the, the, the uh, humble offerings that we, uh, we give will be for you and we truly um, uh, give, give out of our heart through desire to serve you in all things. I thank you for this time. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. It's night now time for uh, greetings and announcements. Um, if this is your first time visiting us, uh, welcome to Hope Presbyterian Church. We have our, our welcoming committee members there to greet you, uh, uh, answer any questions you may have about our church. It's a uh, first step towards uh, becoming a member of Hope Family, and we, we invite you to see them uh, as you walk out. Next, uh, we have what we call reflection time for your edification. We want to go over the Word, allow it to continually transform our lives. And so we invite you guys to stick around for uh, reflection time after the service. Next, um, I want to thank all of you who attended our offices meeting, participated last uh, Monday. Next, um, I will be, I'll be out of town this week attending... Uh, the General Assembly of our denomination. Uh, I'll be in San Francisco uh, representing the North American Presbytery West as its moderator. Please pray for us. You know, as we're going to have the, the English-speaking Presbyter, uh, the representative from the, uh, the English-speaking Presbyteries from the East and the West meet to talk about the future um, of the English-speaking churches. And, you know, we don't know uh, what the Lord has uh, in store for us, but we want, I want to ask you guys to pray for us as we talk about that. Uh, please pray for travel mercies as well. Next, uh, Yak meets Changil is this Thursday. Um, we're so, so thankful that uh, Changil is taking the responsibility to, to, uh, to lead our young adult ministry. And uh, you guys will be meeting. Uh, him this Thursday at Changyeol's place, okay? And, right? Okay. You look a little bit shocked when I said that, so okay. Just wanted to confirm, okay. In Changyeol's place this Thursday, so please set that uh, uh, time aside uh, to to meet together so that, you know, you can serve the Yangodol ministry together. You know, a lot of times we go into church ministry thinking, oh, you serve me, right? But, you know, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we all should have the mindset of how can we serve the people here? How can we serve one another? How can we serve this community? And I hope you approach, approach it that way. Next, uh, BVS is just around the corner, and we want to ask you to pray for uh, the children that will come. We want to pray 
for the people who will be uh, volunteering for the staff. And let's pray that through, through it all, that uh, our more, more and more kids will come to know Jesus Christ. And please pray for uh, the, the two churches as we serve together that will be unified and that will glorify Him um, as we serve uh, our kids together and kids from uh, San Diego together. Next. And uh, again, we're going to have summer retreat uh, with our mother church for our youth group kids. And, and so please uh, sign up if you have not done so. Please speak to uh, Jonathan, if you have any questions, next. And please continue to pray with us. Uh, take every opportunity uh, to pray um, with us. Um, and you can see, um, you know, when we gather to pray. Let's all, I believe that's it, right? Let's all stand and sing the doxology together. <coughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Receive the blessings from the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace, everyone. Please join us for our fellowship outside.